Good evening, church. Uh, welcome to YouTube and our midweek series on one another relationships. Um, hopefully you guys are having a good night. Uh, I personally am talking to my phone for the first time um, doing a midweek, but hey, life is changing and we are adapting, so appreciate you guys being along for the ride. Today we're going to talk about grace um, and the effect of grace in our one another relationships. I wanted to start actually with a question, and I'm actually going to post these questions in the description here of the YouTube video, so that way you guys can talk about this in your small group. Tonight should be fairly short and sweet, and my goal is to leave you guys plenty of time to talk about uh, these things and, and dig deeper into the scriptures amongst yourselves. So first question I wanted to ask is, what does grace mean to you? And I want to... I want you to stop and think about that because grace can have different meanings. And I think when we think about it in the religious sense, we instantly start thinking of forgiveness. But um, when we actually think of grace, God's grace to us was definitely forgiveness, but it was in the form of a gift. It was in giving his son, uh, Jesus, to walk among us, to teach us, to call us to discipleship, and eventually to die for our sins. So, yes, grace is forgiveness, but it is also a gift. I want to put forward uh, another idea here. This one actually comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. And it says this, We have done so, relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. And Paul here is talking about his work as an apostle, how he's reached out to the Corinthian church. Uh, they were in great need of grace. If you read 1 Corinthians, you see all kinds of sin, um, all kinds of trouble, divisions, uh, you know, adultery, um, sexual morality, drunkenness, getting drunk on communion, lots of crazy things that you're kind of going, are these people even Christians? But Paul reaches out to them and offers them uh, a challenge, but he also offers them grace. And when he reflects back on that time, he, he says here in 2 Corinthians uh, that we did so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. So I want to actually put this out here to kind of juxtapose those two ideas, worldly wisdom and God's grace. And my idea behind this is that grace is actually contrary to the world's way of thinking. The world will tell you that there needs to be fairness, that sometimes that fairness is revenge, uh, is you know, holding a grudge, maybe in today's terms, it's unfriending people, uh, toxic people. I see that term thrown around a lot. Uh, but God's grace is contrary to those ideas. And again, I'm not saying this, that you should invite lots of toxic people into your life or any of those things, but God's grace is a contrary idea to looking out for yourself. It is a contrary idea to treating others the way the world would tell you to treat them. So uh, I'm not offering this to you as a simple solution, but maybe as a, as a thought to think about how does God's grace change how we interact with one another and even how we interact with those in the world. So uh, again, Paul juxtaposes these two ideas of worldly wisdom with God's grace. So uh, when we treat each other with grace, we do so not uh, because the other person deserves it, but because we follow Christ's example, because we follow God's example. Uh, you know, grace actually has this power to unite us, and worldly wisdom will actually tend to divide us. And what I get at here is, in, if you look at 1 Corinthians, in the very first chapter of 1 Corinthians, in verse 10, Paul calls us to be united. He calls the church to be of one heart and, and one mindset, because they were breaking into divisions of following this guy or that guy, different sex. Uh, different, uh, you know, divisions or denominations, but instead he, he calls them to, to unite over grace. Um, I think this is very apropos for where we're at today, uh, not just as Christians, but as, a, as, a, as an American society. I feel like we're constantly being called to divide, to, to push people away that disagree with us. Uh, but Paul's goal here wasn't necessarily to say, hey, get rid of everybody that doesn't agree with you, but instead to seek grace, to seek unity because of God's example. Um, I want to ask a second question here. It says this, how does God's grace compel you to be gracious to others? How does it change how you interact with others? But particularly, how does it call you 
and compel you to be gracious to others. Uh, my thought here is actually taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, where Paul talks about how God's grace was not without effect, but that it called him to work harder than all the other apostles because of the grace that was given to him uh, in light of his persecution of the church and who he was before. His, this grace of God motivated him to change and to work hard. And so grace isn't one of these ideas that, oh, I have grace, so now I can kick back, relax, and just enjoy the fact that I'm going to be in heaven someday, so I'm not going to stress about life. Um, there's, there's a lot of balance to this, but I, I want to put forward the idea that grace compels us to action, to mimic God's grace towards us. So let me ask the question again. How does God's grace compel you to be gracious towards others? How does this affect your small group, your family, your coworkers? Uh, I want to read a little bit here from Romans chapter 12. And starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And I love this because it talks about how, what does it look like when we are unified? Does it mean that we all think the same way, that we all have the same talents, that we all do the same things? No. It says we're all members of one body, and just like different body parts, we all have different functions. We look completely different than each other, but we each use those gifts. We don't see those things as things that separate us, but we see these as gifts that help make the whole better, and that we are called by grace to use those gifts that we were given by grace to benefit others. So my next question uh, for you to kick around here in your own uh, groups is, um, what are your gifts? What, like maybe you use this list as an idea to spring for them, but what are your gifts? And also, what can you give? How can you use those gifts to give to others? So I want to put forth this other idea that we as disciples are not called to be consumers. We are called to be creators. Just as God created us with his image inside us, we are creators. So don't be a consumer, be a creator. Don't be a taker, be a giver. And this applies to your small group, applies to your family, applies to your workplace, even just to your life in general. That Try to spend some time thinking about how you can use the gift that God has given you to create more goodness in the world, more light, more hope, more peace, more love. Um, maybe think about this in your small group. What are some ways that you can use your gifts to benefit your small group? Some of you guys are feeling Zoom fatigue, that you are tired of being on Zoom meetings. I feel you, but at the same time, you know, some of the things that, that are, I, I was talking with some brothers actually earlier tonight, some of the things that bother us about Zoom are things that we can actually make better. Um, you know, if, if you're good at Zoom and you have technology uh, technologically challenged people in your group, maybe you can actually give and help out. Maybe you can offer to run the Zoom call so that way you can mute everybody who's got noisy kids in the background or uh, has that echo that's constantly kicking through while everybody's trying to talk and they don't realize it. So that way you can be the, the mute uh, you know, sergeant that's always going around and muting everybody uh, on the Zoom call. Use your gift. Um, you know, plan a game night. If you like to have fun, find something that you can do that's a, that's a game night. And I'm not saying like, okay, maybe you're not comfortable doing a game night in person. You can do games online. There's all kinds of apps and, and games that you can do online. You can do social distance games. Plan something and figure it out. 
Uh, bring your group together. Maybe you don't feel like going to the game night that somebody else planned. But you know what? You can be gracious and you can give and you can go to a game night and actually build your relationships. And I bet you'll actually have some fun. Um, one of the things that's actually benefited our small group as it's actually gotten to the point where it's too big or even in Zoom, it's a little more difficult to actually get engaged because only one person can really engage at a time and it's difficult to, to have little side conversations. Uh, use the breakout room feature. Google it if you don't know about it. But use breakout rooms so that way you can go into smaller groups and talk about these things with just two or three other people and and actually spend some quality time digging in and getting to know each other better. Um, in our group, we've also started doing prayer partners, which is you know we each couple gets another couple that they're prayer partners with, and we try to encourage each other daily. And we try to spend at least one time during the week where we get together and pray, whether it's over the phone or on a prayer walk, or you know you can knock out some 4K40 together. There's lots of ideas, guys. There's so much more out there that I haven't even thought of yet. But I just want to call us to be creators, to be innovators, to uh, to not be satisfied with I'm not. And with the idea of I'm not enjoying my small group. Enjoy your small group because you're using your gifts to give to, to your small group. Uh, a couple of other ideas here. Ephesians 4.16 tells us this. Uh, it says, uh, From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting lig ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we give to one another. Each one of us does our own does our own work. So um, I also was digging through Ephesians four and stumbled on this interesting nugget. Um, Ephesians four twenty nine, a scripture a lot of us are probably uh, familiar with. It says, "Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen." The actual thing I, I stumbled on by looking at other translations is that that word that it may benefit those who listen is actually grace, that it may be a grace to those who listen, to those who hear it. Uh, so we actually need to speak the truth in love to one another. We also need to be careful that we aren't letting unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but realize that what you have to say can be a grace to somebody. It can build them up. It can be a gift to them. So we can't shy away from difficult conversations in our small groups, in our discipling relationships, in our families, uh, but we can have those difficult conversations with love and know that that's actually intended to be a grace to those who hear it. So uh, let me ask a difficult question here. What truth do you need to, to speak in love? Is there somebody that you need to talk to that you've been avoiding just because it's not something you're looking forward to? It's difficult for you? You don't like conflict? Then pray about it and learn to speak the truth in love. Or if you're brave and not, there's not a whole lot of this activity going on in your small group, ask this question. What do I need to hear? What truth needs to be spoken to me in love? So um, as, we, as we bring this thing in, I actually want to bring up one other idea. If you are not in a small group, let me speak the truth in love to you. You have issues. You need to get in a small group. I mean, seriously. Dave has talked about it. We've talked about it many times. Some of you guys are not involved in a small group, and it's not okay. So, and before you get all frustrated that I said you have issues, I have issues too. We all have issues. And that's the point of a small group. We all have issues, and we all need to speak the truth and love to one another. We all need to have grace to each other. And we are not going to become more like Jesus if we are not willing to speak the truth in love and to hear the truth in love. And if you're getting too comfortable just watching church on YouTube and not engaging in fellowship that's going to call you to be more like Christ, then you are missing out on the power of the church. You're missing out on the power of the Holy Spirit. You're missing out on the model of discipleship that Jesus laid out for each one of us. So uh, I realize this may be a little difficult for us. Uh, I also want to throw out this idea from Galatians 5. And in verse 13, it's not that Galatians 5, it says, You were called to be free. Don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So yes, you have freedom in Christ. You don't have to be in a small group. That's not in the Bible. I get that. But could you not 
use your freedom to make others better, to give to others, to serve others in love. This is the idea behind small group. It's not, oh, I don't need somebody watching over me and holding me accountable. I hope you don't. That's great. But speak the truth in love. Be a part. Use your freedom to serve one another humbly in love. Um, James 2, verse 13. And this is a, a comforting thought for those of us that feel intimidated by hearing the truth and love from one another. It says this. It says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And this is the whole point of us being gracious to each other. Yes, we do have some truth that needs to be spoken in love. We do occasionally need to judge each other's behavior as godly and ungodly because, I, I, frankly, I need to hear that whenever I'm acting in an ungodly way. I want to hear that so I can change. But mercy triumphs over judgment. And if we are full of grace, then we overcome. And we see this lesson proven at the cross. Yes, by judgment standards, we do not deserve eternal life. We don't deserve to be close to God. But mercy triumphs over judgment. So let me ask, let me offer these final words as we conclude tonight. Uh, if you're struggling uh, to connect, then reach out. If you were ever in a small group, reach out to somebody in that small group. If you have any relationships, reach out to somebody. If you don't know anybody to reach out to, you know, get on the church website. There's a connect button. Go there. You want my email? It's jglinsky at gmail.com. I'll put it in the description. Connect with me. I'll be happy to get you connected to a group. Um, but if you're tired of Zoom small group, uh, let me offer you this idea instead. Instead of asking, what am I getting out of this? I want you to ask, what am I putting into this? Brothers and sisters, I am so grateful to be a part of a church that believes in discipleship, that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit to transform each and every one of us through the work of the church, through the work of the blood of Christ, through the work of his word in our hearts. And I hope that this has encouraged you. I hope that you can have some great discussion. Uh, look in the YouTube descriptions for these discussion questions. And, uh, and one final thing I want to put out for just a, a word of reminder is uh, check out Disciples Today or you know, the church uh, social media accounts. Coming up next week on Wednesday, I believe, there's going to be a day of prayer and fasting for peace in the world uh, in light of uh, you know, all that's going on, all the divisions, all the, all the struggles, and all the injustice. We're going to have a day as, of prayer and fasting as a collection of churches. Uh, check out the, uh, the various options online for more information. So uh, with that being said, Thank you guys for listening. I hope you all have a great discussion in your small group. I hope you get connected with your small group in a new and more powerful way. And uh, can't wait to see you guys in person whenever that may be. Love you.